son por la mayoría español hablante. Así que he decidido hacer esta información accesible en español para poder expresar no solo mi respeto a los padres indocumentados, pero también a todos los padres emigrantes que han apoyado a sus hijos e hijas a realizar sus sueños. Para comenzar, les quiero platicar un poco sobre quién yo soy y cómo la idea de este proyecto se produjo. Yo, igual que mis dos hermanas, nací en Guerrero, México. En México, mis padres, durante mis primeros cuatro años, hicieron lo mejor que pudieron para darle a nuestra familia la mejor calidad de vida posible. Pero después de seguir constantemente experimentando oportunidades limitadas en México, finalmente decidieron trasladar a nuestra familia a los Estados Unidos en la búsqueda de más oportunidades y con la esperanza de una mejor vida para sus hijas. Después de 17 años en este país, mi familia ha derrotado cada obstáculo que se ha presentado y hemos podido progresar más y más cada año. Mi hermana mayor se graduó de la Universidad de California, Berkeley. Mi hermana menor en unos años seguirá los pasos de sus hermanas mayores. Y yo, después de cuatro largos años, al fin estoy en unos pasos de caminar el escenario y terminar mi, mi licenciatura. Muchos dirían que mi familia ha logrado obtener el muy anhelado sueño americano. Pero aunque hemos obtenido estos logros, algo que no ha cambiado en los últimos 17 años, sin tomar en cuenta todo el esfuerzo y sacrificios de parte de mis padres, es nuestro estado migratorio. Sin embargo, aunque hasta este día mis dos hermanas y yo todavía somos consideradas no comentadas de acuerdo a la ley, nosotras hemos tenido la suerte de beneficiar del programa DACA por ser clasificadas como Dreamers. DACA nos ha cedido, los ha cedido más derechos y abierto más puertas en comparación a nuestros padres. Después de ser testigo de cómo la sociedad criminaliza a mis padres mientras al mismo tiempo nos brinda empatía a mí y a mis hermanas, me plantó la semilla de curiosidad de por qué nosotras éramos tan especial en los ojos del gobierno y no nuestros padres. Esta curiosidad es cual produjo mi pregunta de investigación para este proyecto. ¿De qué manera la narración de Dreamer refuerza el concepto de ilegalidad dentro de la población de padres no comentados al mismo tiempo que mitiga los efectos de ilegalidad entre los Dreamers? Este proyecto exploró la capacidad de resistencia y audacia de que los padres, la primera ola de soñadores dentro de la comunidad no comentada, debe poseer para hacer y soportar el viaje a un país que los explotará incansablemente y los criminalizará sin piedad. La referencia a la primera ola en este estudio se usa para atribuir crédito a la población de padres inalimentados como el primer grupo de emigrantes que llegó a los Estados Unidos que allanó el camino para los dreamers actuales. Hoy en día vivimos en un país con un anti-inmigrante clima político, cual se ha enfocado en, cr en criminalizar a los padres inmigrantes de Dreamers. La razón por esto es en parte el resultado de lo que el gobierno ha definido ser ilegal, o un Dreamer. El término ilegal se refiere a cualquier persona que entró a los Estados Unidos sin un permiso. <coughs> El término Dreamer es el producto de una ley propuesta por el Congreso en agosto de 2001, cual, se, de, cual desafortunadamente no fue aprobada por el gobierno. La ley propuesta llamada Ley de Desarrollo, Alivio y Educación para Menores Extranjeros, o traducido en inglés como Development, Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act, conocido como el Dream Act, tiene el objetivo esencialmente de algún día ceder la, la ciudadanía a algunos inmigrantes, no todos. La exclusividad de esta ley al beneficio de los jóvenes indocumentados afirma la ilegalidad de los padres indocumentados y contribuye a su representación como criminales. Por ejemplo, las cláusulas de haber sido un menor de edad cuando inicialmente entraron a los Estados Unidos y poseer un buen carácter moral atribuye la culpa de la ilegalidad de los jóvenes indocumentados a los padres. La sociedad para cumplir con esta cláusula decidió culpar a los padres de haber desafiado la ley trayendo a sus hijos sin su conocimiento, por lo tanto, retratándolos como los criminales y no los dreamers. Adicionalmente, el rango de edad de 12 a 35 años y el requisito de haber recibido su matriculación de una institución superior o estar en el proceso son principalmente dirigidos para jóvenes 
porque excluye a los padres monumentados quienes no tuvieron la oportunidad de seguir una educación superior. Yo escogí entrevistas como mi método para este estudio piloto porque la literatura sobre la comunidad indocumentada es casi inexistente y la mínima literatura, literatura sobre los padres indocumentados solo los representa como criminales. Para combatir la opinión popular sobre los padres, yo decidí conducir 10 entrevistas semiestructuradas en un espacio cerrado, ya sea en persona o mediamente del uso de la tecnología. Cuando, condu cuando conduciendo las entrevistas, el conocimiento fue solo verbal y no escrito para asegurar la confidencialidad de los participantes. Los par participantes fueron reclutados de boca en boca según los criterios de ser un padre indocumentado de un hijo o hija indocumentada que caiga bajo la narrativa de Dreamer. Es importante clar clarificar que la hija o hijo no tenía que identificarse como un dreamer personalmente para que sus padres puedan participar en el estudio. Los 10 participantes durante las entrevistas compartieron su crianza, carrera educativa o la falta de su carrera educativa, su historia laboral y su experiencia migratoria. Los padres indocumentados son criminalizados por migrar ilegalmente a los Estados Unidos sin evaluar las razones. Muchos padres buscan escapar la pobreza, violencia política y en general la falta de oportunidades en su país de origen. Por ejemplo, un participante hasta exclamó a recordar, mi papá trabajaba todo el día en el campo para poder darle a nuestra familia de comer. Nosotros comíamos arroz, frijoles, chile y tortillas. Pero algunos días, cuando mi papá no ganaba suficiente, comíamos mantecas con tortilla. En la mayor parte, las razones para, para emigrar son consecuencia del imperialismo de los Estados Unidos en México. Los Estados Unidos nunca ha tomado la responsabilidad por crear las condiciones cuales causan a los padres a no tener otra opción más que emigrar, emigrar para poder sobrevivir. La razón más común de migración declarada por los participantes fue para ofrecerles una mejor calidad de vida a sus hijos. En adición, un tema común entre los participantes fue que el haber experimentado pobreza dentro de su crianza y cómo cor cor correlacionó con su logro educativo y oportunidades de empleo tanto en su país de origen como en los Estados Unidos. Aunque todos los participantes recibieron menos de una educación secundaria, y no continuaron su educación, una vez en los Estados Unidos, todos los padres mencionaron la importancia de que de obtener una educación, así como el deseo de haber podido tener la oportunidad de haber continuado su educación. Una participante llamada Josefina, así la nombré, pero no es un nombre verdadero, comentó, a mí me encantaba ir a la escuela. Yo siempre fui una de las mejores estudiantes, pero la escuela no me aseguraba que mi familia tuviera algo que comer todos los días. Lo que Josefina contó, comentó fue algo común que muchos participantes uh, exclamaron. El requisito primario que descalifica a los padres como dreamers es su falta de educación superior. Padres han renunciado a la oportunidad de estudiar una carrera, cual ha resultado en teniendo que trabajar no solo uno o dos trabajos a la vez, pero también siendo víctimas de explotación laboral sin quejarse por el miedo de ser deportados o no poder darle lo esencial a sus hijos como un techo o comida. Los padres indocumentados forman parte de la economía informal, desempeñando trabajos laboriosos como ser trabajadores de campo, mantenimiento, amas de casa, cocinera, etc. Básicamente cualquier trabajo que no requiera educación. Esos trabajos que son parte de la economía informal consisten de horas largas en condiciones inseguras con un sueldo inferior al salario mínimo. A diferencia de la economía informal, la economía formal es compuesta de gente que puede trabajar legalmente, así que no están, sujeto a, no están sujetos a explotación laboral. Algunos miembros de la comunidad indocumentada han tenido la oportunidad de formar parte de la economía formal como resultado del programa Acción Deferida para Llegadas Infantiles, o conocido en inglés como Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA. La orden ejecutiva DACA del presidente Obama permite a algunas personas que fueron traídas ilegalmente a los Estados Unidos cuando eran niños que reciban un permiso renovable de dos años 
cual difiere de deportación y los hace elegible para un permiso de trabajo en los Estados Unidos. En diferencia del DREAM Act, DACA no proporciona un camino a la ciudadanía. El programa DACA, aunque los padres lo ven como una bendición para sus hijos, no solo asegura la economía informal al excluir a los padres, pero al mismo tiempo asegura la economía formal con DREAMers. El desinterés del gobierno en ayudar a la comunidad indocumentada es obvio en la implantación del programa porque su único interés es beneficiar económicamente de la labor que la gente indocumentada produce. La narración de Dreamer incrustada en el programa DACA ha resultado en el aumento de persecución de los padres y la alabanza de los jóvenes porque son vistos como el modelo de inmigrantes. Sin tomar en consideración que los Dreamers son quienes son por, los, por todos los sacrificios y esfuerzos de sus padres. Con respecto a su experiencia de, de migración, la, la mayoría de los participantes describieron su viaje como difícil. Dos, participaron, dos participantes indicaron que no, ya no recordaban el viaje a los Estados Unidos. Su vacilación de hablar sobre su experiencia migratoria me llevó a concluir que la dificultad del viaje no es un tema cual los padres indocumentados discuten frecuentemente. Adicionalmente, el, el reacio de los, de los participantes me llevó a decidir a deducir que la, res, la, la resistencia que los padres poseen es incalculable porque no solo han tenido que sacrificar sus propios sueños y experimentar injusticias, pero adicionalmente han tenido que lidiar con los efectos de su salud mental por todo el trauma que han vivido y siguen experimentando. Antes de que la disciplina de los, estados, de los estudios de chicanas y chicanos fuera creada, las experiencias de chicanas y chicanos eran invisibles. Este departamento se enfoca en dar a conocer las experiencias de chicanas y chicanos y este año, con medio de este programa de honores, me ha dado el conocimiento y apoyo para poder compartir las historias sobre los incalculables logros de los padres indocumentados de Dreamers. Este programa es fundamental porque, a diferencia de otros programas, los permite entre, entrelazar nuestros conocimientos de otras disciplinas. Para concluir mi presentación, le quiero dar gracias a los participantes por darme la confianza de compartir sus historias, a mi mentor profesor, a, a mi mentor profesor Francisco Lomelí por ayudarme a realizar este proyecto, el programa ERCA por financiar el estudio, y finalmente, y más importante, a mis padres, Mira y Benito, por siempre apoyarme a realizar todas mis metas, porque sin el sueño de ellos para nuestra familia, yo no estaría a punto de realizar uno más de mis sueños. Es por padres como ellos que las metas de Dreamers son posibles de consumar. La exclusividad de la narrativa Dreamer ha generado una mayor marginación entre la comunidad indocumentada, disminuyendo la posibilidad de una reforma migratoria integral. Por lo tanto, los Dreamers deben comenzar a rechazar esa narrativa que ha llevado a la criminalización de sus padres. Gracias. For those of you who just arrived, again, there are programs on seats. If you want to refer to them? Yeah. Okay. okay. Vamos a seguir con las presentaciones. Our next presenter is Ana Guerrero. So, Ana, if you would like to come up. Hi everyone, so my name is Ana Guerrero and my project is um, called uh, Finding a Home in a Racist Place, Latinx Immigrants in the San Fernando Valley. So my grandfather had already been living in the valley for over 20 years when my mom and dad had decided to join him. It was November 2001 and I was five years old when they joined him in Canoga Park, a neighborhood in the west side of the San Fernando Valley. Canoga Park is separated and segregated. You cross Lanark Park, and then there's, you don't know where it's at. 
Um, and then that part. You encounter houses occupied by predominantly white middle to upper class families and the newly gentrified village. I grew up in the east side, and although my father was undocumented, and my family it was undocumented, this predominantly Latinx community made it simple for my parents to send money back to our family back in Mexico, obtain employment, and avoid law enforcement encounters with the help of other Valley, Valley Latinx residents. Although we live across from a park where bodies were frequently found, and there was constant sirens ringing in the middle of the night, there was still a sense of community with the predominantly Latinx neighborhood. The San Fernando Valley today is home to a significant number of Mexican and Central Americans. Some of these individuals have no legal U.S. citizenship status, and many have been living like this for the Valley for decades. There is a long history of displacement and marginalization of communities of color in the San Fernando Valley dating back to Spanish conquests. After the United States seized California in the Mexican-American War, white land developers sought to make the San Fernando Valley a white space where citizenship and its benefits could only be obtained through white skin. Nonetheless, the Valley's Mexican population continued to grow. My family had settled in a community that was part of a bigger physical space with long history of racial oppression and anti-immigrant actions. Yet the Latinx population demonstrated incredible perseverance. The San Fernando Valley has become home to a host of grassroots activists, organizations like El Hormiguero, Pacoima Beautiful, and Tia Chucha Centro Cultural, which provide services to local immigrants and other Latinx residents while pushing for immigrant and Latinx rights on a national political scale, demonstrating resistance to, through a long history of marginalization. Based on archives found in the Frank Delomo collection at California State University, Northridge, California Immigration Union recruitment pamphlets found at the Hathi Trust Digital Library, Housing documents found in the test bed for the redlining archives of California exclusionary spaces <laughs> in a new form of archival work using Instagram, Facebook, pages of grassroots organizations that provide flyers and pictures of events that study this study aims to answer. How did racial and immigration sentiments and practices in the San Fernando Valley aim to preserve white supremacy? And how are Latinx residents able to strive to in the San Fernando Valley while being continuously displaced and discriminated against? What I found were various instances of discrimination and, for, for, a for, and forms of racial cleansing, which aim to benefit white individuals and further displace Latinx populations. However, through my findings, I also discovered a, that regardless of these practices, Latinx folks have invested back in their neighborhoods in order to create a spatial imaginary where residents create community-based solutions to bring back value into their communities. Neighborhoods like Pacoima and San Fernando were created when railroads were built in the valley between the 1870s and the 1880s. The creation of the railroads was one of the first signs of displacement of these Mexican communities as push for immigration from what from white individuals from Europe and Eastern states was being implemented by railroad and landowners. This was demonstrated when Charles McLay, a land investor, funded the creation of the San Fernando neighborhood and collaborated with the California Immigration Union. The union collaborated with large landowners such as McLay to promise benefits to white immigrants who would be open to buying a portion of their property. This ensured upward economic mobility for new white residents of the San Fernando Valley, but would simultaneously prevent Mexican individuals from becoming land and homeowners, even though they had been living there for years. The California Immigration Union and its partnership with landowners would give Im white immigrants a path to citizenship that would be constantly denied to immigrants of color in the San Fernando Valley. The union's recruitment pamphlet, All About California, and the inducement to settle there was filled with racist undertones that pushed for white, a white valley. The pamphlet's first page provides a statement about California's needs for immigration by Henry H. Hype, the then governor of California, stating, quote, we need populations, not racist, inferior in natural traits. We need immigrants of the kindred race who will constitute a congenial element and locate themselves and their families permanently upon the soil, end quote. The advertising for white immigrants proved successful, 
and further displacement of Mexican communities continued in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley. In the 1930s, anti-immigrant sentiments surrounding the Great Depression began another displacement of the communities of color that were already established there. Much of the San Fernando Valley mimicked President Herbert Hoover's racist beliefs towards Mexican communities. According to Abraham Huffman, quote, President Hoover believed that the immigrants were taking the jobs and could be that could have been for U.S. native born individuals and began to endorse a tough effort to reduce both legal and illegal entry into the United States, end quote. This sounds very familiar. Yeah. Um, initially, William N. Doak, the Secretary of Labor at the time, primed to solve the unemployment problem by creating an extremely malicious environment where conditions would be made so bad for Mexicans that they would opt for self-deportation. Do collaborate with Charles P. Weisel, coordinator of the city committee, to create these, quote, psychological gestures, end quote, that played on immigrants' fear. Immigrants who had entered the country in a way that was labeled illegally and had resided in the valley for previous years were made to feel fear for the first time due to their lack of legal status. Weisel's scare tactics did not work and instead influenced the Los Angeles economy in a negative way with business owners complaining that their maneuver had only made them lose customers. On Ash Wednesday in 1931, according to John Paul de Guzman, raids in Mexican communities in Bocoima and San Fernando took place where hundreds of Mexican and Mexican Americans were unable to show proof of citizenship were deported. Many Latinx communities were weakened because of this repatriation and expatriation. <laughs> Furthermore, during the 1930s, housing practices that benefited white individuals, such as the National Housing Act of 1934, which made redlining legal, limited resources and benefits such as highly rated schools, better environmental conditions, and overall higher investment in predom to predominantly white neighborhoods. In 1933, the Home Owners Loan Corporation created a, quote, appraisal method, end quote, where grades were given to neighborhoods based on their racial demographics. The grades determine if individuals living in the areas would be approved for housing loans and other benefits. In March 23, 23, 1939, both Pacoima and San Fernando were given a G grade, where residents would be denied loans and would lower home, own, home ownership. The grade was justified because Pacoima was a, quote, Mexican settlement, end quote, which demonstrated, quote, no residential significance, end quote. Similarly, San Fernando's grade was justified for being a, quote, old blighted resident, old blighted area populated by largely, by very largely by Mexican laborers, end quote. In comparison, the predominantly white neighborhood of Encino was giving an A grade for being, quote, protected from racial hazards, end quote. Today, Pacoima and San Fernando remain largely inhabited by Latinx individuals, while Encino remains 80% white. Historical housing practices have not only affected the current neighborhood's demographics, but have affected continuous investment and resources in these neighborhoods. In 1976, Mercer Airlines, located in Burbank, an incorporated city in the San Fernando Valley, was sold by its previous owner, D. White W. Mercer, to VIP Air Aircraft Leasing Inc. The charter airline based on Hollywood Burbank Airport was renamed Pacific American. According to Frank Del Olmo, a journalist from Pacoima, Pacific American Airlines and the INS conducted a, quote, experiment, end quote, that repatriated many undocumented Mexican and Central American men to Mexico in order to examine how many undocumented men would return to the U.S. after deportation and how long it would take for them to return. The program would aim to fingerprint the men in order to keep records of them. Fueled by anti-immigrant sentiments that were spread throughout the U.S. by President Ford supporting the Regino Bill, which would require employers to ask for their workers' legal status, undocumented immigrants were seen as removable in order to solidify white spaces. Mirroring the 1930s repatriation that occurred in the San Fernando Valley outside of the Catholic Church in Pacoima, in neighboring Los Angeles communities, this airlift created a process of ethnic cleansing in order to solidify white communities and a white San Fernando Valley, where only white residents, regardless of legal status, would reap the benefits of citizenship. 
According to a United Press International Air article written by Stephen Downer, the Mexican government saw the program as being, quote, inhumane and immoral, end quote. It would not help INS with the experiment. The Mexican government did not assist due to their moral reasons, however, but was instead worried about the hundreds of Mexican workers that would be thrown into their already depressed job market in Mexico. Regardless, the $2 million program and partnership continued to repatriate undocumented Mexican workers to Mexico in what they called, quote, champagne flights, end quote. However, these airplanes were anything but glamorous, and as they were also used to transport chickens and had been previously malf had previous malfunctions and resulted in deaths months before. And these um, newspapers demonstrate that, that there was like deaths with these airplanes months before. This event demonstrates this dehumanization of Mexican undocumented individuals and their formation of being disposable on the basis of lack of citizenship. The San Fernando Valley continued to invest in the displacement of communities of color for the purpose of keeping a white suburban space. George Sanchez describes this as a, quote, ethnic cleansing, where racialized populations outside the boundaries of citizenship status are denied human rights, end quote. Landowners in the 1860s, government officials in the 1930s, INS officials and executives from Pacific American Airlines perpetuated widespread ideologies and efforts of creating a white valley through a repeated displacement of Latinx communities. Yet Latinx residents have invested back in their own people and spaces. The concept of the white spatial imaginary and the black spatial imaginary were introduced by sociology and black studies professor George Lipsitz. When we take a look at the different neighborhoods where the majority of residents are white, there is a disproportionate amount of wealth in comparison to predominantly black and or Latinx neighborhoods. This is due to historical practices that have resulted in created large disinvestment in, the, disinvestment in these predominantly black neighborhoods and similarly in brown neighborhoods, while allo allocating inv investment and resources into white neighborhoods. Racist housing practices, and in this case, immigration actions, have helped maintain these resources in these predominantly white neighborhoods. However, Lipsitz describes the opposite of the white spatial imaginary as being a black spatial imaginary, where historically segregated and predominantly black neighborhoods have been largely disinvested, which have been largely disinvested in, have resisted in their lack of resources by building community-based solutions. The black spatial imaginary censors black residents, especially youth, by providing each other with knowledge that influenced their experiences in their neighborhoods and giving them the tools necessary to give pride and empowerment in their communities. Latinx residents in the San Fernando Valley have created a similar imaginary that I want to term the brown spatial imaginary. In 1996, Pacoima Beautiful was found by five mothers who wanted to improve Pacoima's environment through community efforts based on community-engaged activism. Programs were created by community members for community members. These programs educate local Pacoima residents in, on environmental justice while simultaneously encouraging community building. Via Chucha Centro Cultural was founded in 2001 in Selmar with efforts to engage local Latinx residents with knowledge about their history and culture through literacy. With, partners, with partnerships such as the one with the organization No More Deaths, which provides individuals crossing the border with medical needs and food, the Atrucha Centro Cultural has been centered to help the undocumented individuals at the local and national level. Throughout the years, the Atrucha Centro Cultural has become a place of community congregation and center for community activism that allows for cultural empowerment. In 2001, El Hormiguero opened their community space in Pacoima, home to community leaders and activists and, space, and a safe space for undocumented immigrants. This space hosts workshops and provides the community with their resources not only educates them on their rights, but also allows for community empowerment. With the help of these grassroots organizations, Latinx residents have created a brown spatial imaginary. Although the San Fernando Valley continues to be largely segregated today, grassroots organiza organizations and their investment to predominantly Latinx communities have created an epicenter of human and immigrant rights activism through their own capital that has made the Valley a vibrant center of Latinx culture and community engagement. As Chicana X scholars, we often bring to light through our research untold stories that are often destroyed due to a whitewashing of history that aims to erase our narratives. I hope through, through my research, I am able to contribute to the field of Chicana X studies 
by not only pushing to the forefront this racist history that is often erased, but by also re recognizing the work and resistance these Latinx communities have created as a response to these practices. I contribute to the understudy of San Fernando Valley and hope to continue this research in the future. Thank you to Erka for like helping me go to the library and like just spend like hours at the archives. <laughs> um, and then also thank you to my advisor, Paul Spickard, because you've like been there throughout the last three years and well, four years. And it's, yeah, you just have, sorry. Um, thanks so much for that today. It's very powerful. Um, wondering, so do you actually travel to the archives? Yeah, so I'm originally from the San Fernando Valley. I Well, I'm from Guadalajara, but I have been in Canoga Park since I was five. So I, I was like, where am I going to find these archives? So I went to CSUN. I just, I went with my partner and we were just like looking for hours. And he's like, he like passed me the, the archive and he's like, wait, what does this say? And then we looked at it and it's, there was a another repatriation in the 1970s so i'm like i can't i can't believe this is real and then i i started looking at the names and everything and yeah there was like proof of story there's low if i go back this the one on the right it's um it's this person from ins that's like yes to frank del olmo this is true this whole story is true and then, so I um, talked to another professor from UC Davis, um, Lorena Orozosa, and she's like, well, this has happened in Chicago as well during the same time period. And she likes me a lot of things. So it was, it, was, it was really off for me, like, this happened, and it's, yeah, but I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Great content. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, I'm going to move on. The next student who is going to present today is Jessica Lopez Salazar. Hola y bienvenidos a todos. Mi nombre es Jessica López. Antes que nada quiero dar el agradecimiento a mi mentora, la profesora Eli Hernández, que nos encuentra hoy, pero me ha ayudado bastante durante este proyecto. Y más que nada a mis padres, que porque sin ellos no estuviera aquí ahorita, y a mi familia que vinieron de Sacramento y para, para estar conmigo. El título de mi proyecto se llama Corridos, Narco, Corridos y Narco Cultura. Este tema, este tema tiene mucho que ver con todo lo histórico, político y social de las comunidades latinas y mexicanas que viven cercanas de la, fronte, de la frontera estadounidense mexicana. Cuando pensamos de la frontera, pensamos de algo lejano, de algo concreto, de algo delineado por leyes extranjeras, pero es mucho más que eso. Nos olvidamos que existen comunidades que han, de, que han hecho de su existencia en un lugar militar, militarizado y vigilado y que han buscado maneras de poder desafiar conflictos transnacionales. Una de las maneras que estas comunidades han superado estos conflictos ha sido a través de la música, en especial a través de los corridos. Me gustaría darles un contexto histórico sobre los corridos. En su forma primal, los corridos se reconocen como romances, coplas, como baladas o cuandos. Funcionaban de manera que decían historia con una balada narrativa. Estas baladas se hicieron prominentes durante los años de 1870 a 1930, un periodo de tiempo donde las implicaciones de la colonización española y americana fueron evidentes por todas las Américas. Estas baladas funcionaban como una manera de representar los, sufrimien los sufrimientos, las experiencias y las vidas de las comunidades hispanoamericanas que día a día batallaban contra sus colonizadores. 
Los corridos tienen predominio en la zona fronteriza, ya que es esta zona donde hay una mezcla de culturas entre americanos y mexicanos, y en aquel tiempo también, también españoles. Es por eso que se ha convertido, es por eso que el corrido se ha convertido en un fenómeno, en, en un fenómeno del pasado y del presente que sigo continuando las historias del ayer. En mi investigación toco dos términos. Uno, el corrido antiguo de los años rudimentales. Estos corridos antiguos cuentan historias de migración, de sufrimientos, trastornos, asimilación forzada, trama cultural y sobre la lucha por la justicia política, social y cultural. Dos, el corrido nuevo de la nueva era. Estos son corridos del presente que han sido traídos a la luz durante una era, dificulta, una, una era dificultada económica en Estados Unidos y México, a través de la violencia, de la pobreza exacerbada, de la corrupción del gobierno mexicano, de la explotación del gobierno estadounidense, del desenlace de los narcostados, del desenlace de la narcoeconomía, de la narcocultura y de las, de las drogas de los cárteles. Pero más que nada se han desenlazado porque hay una lucha de una comunidad que está buscando su autonomía. Los corridos son importantes porque han sido y siguen siendo como un himno simbólico para las comunidades mexicanas y, y latinas en estas áreas de los países. El corrido funciona como una herramienta para contar historia, historias y poder expresar y comunicar las historias de los mexicanos que han emigrado a Estados Unidos, o contar sobre una tierra madre nostálgica, o sobre otros aspectos de la narcocultura, entre otras historias. Los corridos se han convertido en un mecanismo revolucionario para lidiar con la frontera que está constantemente cambiando, para lidiar con, autorita con autoritarios y el conflicto de culturas, y las fuerzas diaspóricas entre las comunidades mexicanas y chicanas de ambos países. También son una red de comunicación entre comunidades separadas por fronteras. Al igual, funcionan como una manera de hacer valer, de hacer valer la presencia de mexicanos y chicanos y es una manera de sentirse unidos y en solidaridad, en solidaridad a través de fronteras. Para poder formular un mejor entendimiento en este estudio, quiero representar unos términos importantes que existen en este campo del estudio de chicanos y chicanas. El primero, la diáspora de la zona fronteriza es el lugar comunal, geográfico y cultural que abarca la zona estadounidense mexicana fronteriza. Esto incluye la dispersión de mexicanos y chicanos de su tierra ancestral. El segundo, el biculturismo transnacional se refiere a la existencia y mezcla de la cultura mexicana y chicana a través de la frontera nacional estadounidense mexicana. Con esto en mente, las preguntas de mi investigación son ¿Cómo es que la diáspora de la zona fronteriza y el biculturismo transnacional ha influido las historias contadas por medio de los narcocorridos. ¿Y por qué es que esta versión contemporánea de los narcocorridos se han hecho tan populares en los Estados Unidos, ya que las realidades en México no son las mismas realidades aquí en Estados Unidos? ¿Cómo han afectado los corridos a los, me a los mecanismos de supervivencia de las comunidades chicanas y mexicanas que están peleando contra la militariz militarización de la frontera y otros tipos de agobios? Para mi investigación estudié el trabajo de dos honorables e importantes contribuidores al campo de este estudio. Uno de ellos, Américo Paredes, inició la investigación académica del estudio contemporáneo de la literatura hispanoamericana. Fue el primer mexicano americano en recibir su doctorado en inglés en la Universidad de Texas. Su trabajo académico se ha enfocado en el desmantelamiento de prejuicio contra los mexicanos y mexicanos americanos. Otra de ellas, Elena Simonet, recibió su doctorado en etnomusicología de la Universidad de California, Los Ángeles. Ha conducido investigaciones en música mexicana regional y en la difusión transnacional de este género de música. Voy a compartirles una frase del académico Richmond que dice, Los narcocorridos son un poco apacibles en comparación a la violencia que ocurre en la vida real diaria como resultado del tráfico de drogas. Los narcocorridos no son una causa del tráfico de drogas, al contrario, son un efecto o aspecto de la narcocultura. Esta frase es importante porque trae a luz una perspectiva diferente. 
En otras palabras, habla de que los narcocorridos no causan directamente el tráfico de drogas. Es de decir, que los narcocorridos no vienen antes del tráfico de drogas, sino que los narcocorridos son un resultado de la necesidad de desenmascarar y exponer la ruda realidad de la narcocultura y los efectos del crimen organizado y los gobiernos corruptos. Richmond estudió los narcocorridos en comparación al rap y concluyó que, al igual que el género del, del rap, los narcocorridos son resultados de las realidades y experiencias que viven los pueblos comuni y comunidades desamparadas y marginadas. Simone dio idea a dos, a dos conceptos, narcocorridos comisionados y los narcocorridos comerciales. Los narcocorridos comisionados son aquellos corridos que son compuestos por los corridistas que aceptan sobornos de líderes de carteles poderosos. En mi investigación me enfoqué más en los corridos, en los narcocorridos comerciales. Estos corridos son compuestos por compositores reconocidos en el mundo del entretenimiento y sirven como reflexión desde un punto de vista exterior de la narcocultura. Usualmente en estos narcocorridos, los protagonistas de la canción son prototipos del narco, o sea, son personajes inventados para obtener una mercancía comercializable en la en industria musical. Para dirigir mi investigación, analicé las composiciones de narcocorridos y corridos y videos musicales. También observé las letras y componentes cinematográficos de estos corridos. Específicamente me enfoqué en el grupo corridista Los Perdidos de Sinaloa y la fallecida cantante chicana Jenny Rivera. Escogí analizar a Jenny Rivera porque ella obtuvo una presencia aumentadora en una industria musical machista. Ahora les mostraré una escena de la canción La Historia del Joven, compuesta por el grupo corrista Los Perdidos de Sinaloa. Observen bien las escenas, la letra de la canción y cómo se desenlace la historia. que hago, yo salgo ganando. Después de analizar los componentes de este video, concluí que hay temas constantes. La primera, hay una aclamación de natividad a una tierra específica. En este corrido, no sé si escuch se escuchó en esta parte, pero hicieron una aclamación al estado de Nayarit como un saludo patriótico. Los corridos usualmente hacen una aclamación a comunidades nativas a través de estos llamados estados. Es como una manera de estar cercanos a tus seres queridos que están al otro lado de la frontera. Número dos, hay un valor de familia. En los corridos usualmente hay un reconocimiento y aprecio hacia la familia. 
en este video, que no alcanzamos a ver, pero al final del video se muestra donde regresa el compositor, el protagonista, y le compra una casa con un bonito jardín a su madre y una ropa muy fina a su padre. Y concluyen decir que lo hace todo por ellos, que comprueba que el valor de familia es muy importante. Número tres, hay una prepotencia de lujos y la vida consumista. Se miran carros lujosos, ropa extravagante, este, joyas muy caras. Y número cuatro, no puede faltar la asociación a cárteles de drogas, que vieron en la escena donde se despejó el problema de cárteles rivales. No tenemos tiempo de ver el video de Jefa de Jefas, pero <risa> esa canción es una composición de Jenny Rivera y es un ejemplo de un corrido comercial porque ella canta de una estancia que es narcotraficante y sabemos que Jenny Rivera no era narcotraficante, era una cantante de la música industrial, pero bueno... En cuanto a los corridos de Jenny Rivera, he concluido que Jenny Rivera revolucionó la representación de mujeres en la narcocultura. No hay ninguna otra mujer que ha, simulado, que ha simbolizado una presencia de una mujer en este género de música más que ella. Ella representa la narcotraficante creada a través de sus composiciones. De nuevo, es una protagonista creada, inventada. Ella representa una proclamación de los esfuerzos de mujeres y también demuestra una luz heroica para las mujeres marginadas. Para concluir mi análisis, los corridos y narcocorridos son canales para expresar historias sobre la opresión política y socioeconómica. Son historias que luchan para humanizar a aquellos mexicanos y chicanos que son discriminados, considerados bandidos y marginados a causa de falta de oportunidades. Han creado comunidades tolerantes y resistentes a la ruda y violenta realidad. Son una forma de desahogar, una forma de, de consolación emocional y una forma de manifestación. Y finalmente, mi investigación de corridos, narcocorridos y narcocultura ofrece un enfoque histórico para lograr entender el predominio de este tipo de corridos entre las comunidades mexicanas y chicanas, especialmente este lado de la frontera. Da un avance al por qué los corridos y narcocorridos son tan importantes para descifrar durante un tiempo de aumento en la militarización y vigilancia fronteriza y marginación hacia la comunidad chicana y mexicana. Con esto me despido y muchas gracias. Yeah, so, um, ¿por qué escogí este tema? Escogí el tema porque cuando era niña, me acuerdo que siempre estábamos en el carro con mis papás y mi hermana y yo siempre le decíamos a mis papás, cambien la música, no nos gusta la música mexicana, por favor, cambien la música americana, de inglés. Pero conforme fui creciendo y fui desarrollando una conciencia chicana y una aprecio a mi cultura mexicana, fui realizando que esta música no era fea, o sea, hay historia y hay significado mucho más escondido a lo que vemos en las noticias, porque en realidad los narcocurridos son como maneras de, de decir nuestras historias, no más que este, los the social media uh, they have politicized this in a very negative light. So, I encourage you que piensen de los narcocorridos y corridos en una manera un poquito diferente, porque es una manera de, 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 es como la voz de un pueblo que no ha sido escuchada por las noticias, pero ha sido escuchada por los compositores narcocorridistas. Yes. Uh, my question is free. So do you have a favorite song or favorite song <laughs> around this, like, type of corrido? I do, and I'm going to say that this song is not very... Like positive, <laughs> you know. Um, those narco corridos usually shed light on more of an illicit lifestyle. You know, um, la vida se dice la vida alegre en los narco corridos y los músicos, los videos musicales ves la tomadera y a veces drogas y así. Pero yo digo que es más como no es un estilo de vida, es como una cultura que tú vives a través de ver, de ver estos videos, pero en realidad no lo haces tú, ¿me entiendes? Es como una manera de sentirte muy mexicano, muy mexicana. Pero para contestar tu pregunta, mi favorita canción es El Solecito. Yeah.
I forgot the artist. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I don't know how to question. I just wanted to say, it's always waiting for the media to tell you. Um, you inspired me so much and to be a new uh, media presence and the media that you have behind the uh, microphone is uh, inspired. And I also applaud you because you always make sure that you know you um such a female um body there that you make sure that um you understand that really we'll see that representation. So thank you always. Thank you so much, it was great seeing you again. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to take a 10 minute intermission. So please grab some more coffee and cookies. The restrooms are here towards your left. Um, so see you back in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
We're going to start in about three minutes. Vamos a empezar en como tres minutos, más o menos. Oh, it is on. I was like, what's the name of it? I was like, I get so much. 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 I was like, I get so much
Fifteen years, you're gonna be right there too long. All right, thank you, folks. So we're going to, vamos a empezar. Okay. All right. I started with this uh, second round, or next round of presentation. So up next, we have Ricardo Mata. Good afternoon. My name is Ricardo Mata, and the title of my research is Imagining Sacred Ecology, Danza Mexicayo and the, Nat and the Natural World. Uh, be before I get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in the San Fernando Valley. I was raised by a single mother who migrated from a small pueblo in Jalisco. Growing up, I wasn't the most studious of kids. I graduated high school miraculously, but sadly, with a 1.7 GPA. After high school, I attended community college as a formality. I had no interest in education at that point. I dropped out after a year and I joined the workforce. After a few years of working various jobs, I became hungry for socioeconomic mobility and somewhat hungry for expanding my understanding of this world. I returned to my community college and began taking courses in Chicanic studies, eventually joining Mecha. Most if not all Mecha events, have an indigenous cultural element. So often I found myself witnessing the beauty. That is an update. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty that is Danza Mexicayo. You know, colorful flowers covering asphalt, feathers filling the air with pungent but sweet smell of burning copal, the sounds of drums and shakers clashing with the clanking cars and city noise. It intensified my senses and it sparked a deep curiosity. I was further captivated by this practice at a community space called Tia Chucha Centro Cultural. Shout out. <laughs> um, at this space, I recall arriving nervously, feeling out of place, but determined to explore the roots of my curiosity. Unsure of myself, I sat entirely through the first practice Playing, uh, paying close attention to the dancers' feet and using my hands as drumsticks and my thighs as drums. On this day, I only partook as an observer. The following week, I took my shoes off and barefoot, I began my personal journey into Lanza Mexicayo. I would like to first briefly explain why I use the term Mexicayo instead of Azteca, which is often associated with the Conchero tradition. Although similar at its root, the distinguishing factor between Conchero Danza Azteca and Danza Mexicayo would be their respective relationship to the Catholic Church. Although the practice is known to have survived through the church, over the last 40 to 50 years, many have adopted a version of Danza that removes Catholic concepts. That being said, I'll get started. Chicano scholar, Ernesto Tlahuitolini Colín's, Colín's study of Danza Mexicayo demonstrates how Danza is used and as, as an educational tool for embodied learning. 
describing how fu a fully aesthetic experience invoking ancient Mexicano traditions allowed dancers to acquire a particular knowledge of the world, including mathematics, patterns, multiple languages, physiology, music, leadership skills, interpersonal relationships, uh, hospitality, art, astronomy, and spirituality. What underscores the, this collective knowledge parallels what cellular biologists have long determined about ecology, humanity, and wildlife. And that is that everything is related to everything else. In my research, I explore how performing Danza Mexicayo transforms the social imaginary towards acknowledging this interconnectivity. How participating in Danza Mexicayo, the, danza, the danzante embodies a knowledge that ascribes notions of sacredness to humanity, wildlife, and ecology. Chicana feminist, uh, Chicana feminist scholar and danzante Jenny Kiawicoa Luna writes that Danza Mexicayo is recognized by many as a formal manifestation of a spiritual belief system. And my ethnography expands on this idea seeking to explain how danza becomes an embodied spiritual practice that generates social and environmental compassion. Guided by the notion of social imaginary, which scholars argue is immediate, practical, and essential for society, I decided to conduct a series of interviews to get a scope of the social imaginary within the danza mexicayo community. I invited dancers from Southern California to share a piece of their imagination by articulating their perceptions of sacredness and ecology in relation to Danza Mexicayo. My belief is that when humans embody movements that mirror or represent particular natural or cosmological elements, they are fusing their mind, body, and spirit with a natural phenomenon. For example, the danza sinteo, or maiz, is dedicated to the corn energy. The concept of the root and the flower is a metaphor that structures each danza. Most danzas are anchored by a root movement. The root movement is repeated throughout the danza. And in between root movements, the danza is decorated with flowers. These flowers change throughout the dance, but remain connected to the spirit of the root movement. In this clip, you will see the first flower, which is the planting of seeds, the root movement, which is a, a pose looking like a corn stalk, and the twist to represent the spiral of the corn. The second flower, which is the sprouting of the seed, the shell breaking open, and back to the root movement. All movements are repeated twice, which encourages synchronization and harmony between danzantes. There's the planting of the seeds. That's the root movement. They're trying to mimic this. The seeds sprouting. Through movement, the danzante begins to digest the concept of this natural phenomena in relation to their body. From this, an awareness of interconnectivity is heightened. For example, for example, Cuscateco, a 32-year-old danzante with 15 years of experience, describes this awareness. You know, because when we dance, we dance with the elements. We do a wind dance, we do a, a water or a rain dance or a fire dance, an earth dance. You know, we do all these things. And at first, you're just kind of moving and going through the motion, but it comes to a point where you start to question and think like, okay, well, what am I doing with this movement? Am I caressing the earth here? Am I attempting to spin like the wind? 
um, what, what is it that's happening? And then you start to observe nature a lot more, maybe more than most people do. Guscateco describes how this awareness occurs once the danzante is no longer consumed by trying to learn the steps, and they become cognizant of the concepts that they embody through the dance. Another danzante, 26-year-old Ansimli, expresses how danza has influenced her views of nature. Like while you're dancing, are you do you have like concepts of nature? Oh yeah, I feel like uh, the biggest one is the heka, wind and um, mm -hmm. being a bird, being free. It's like rising of the phoenix. You know, it's like it, it burns itself to ashes in order to you know come out with a new a new coat, a new being, a new way of seeing the world. Because I think. The bird, uh, it, it represents compassion. When I think of Lanza, it's like I'm a, I'm a bird, I'm free, I'm able to be, I don't have an age, I don't have, like I just, I can be present in the moment, not only with myself, but with everyone around me and all the energies that are present. Given these responses, it is evident that Lanza in some way is influencing how they imagine the natural world. But it isn't just dancing. Although, although drumming is not dancing, the drum is vital to the practice of danza mexicayo. Without it, the aural component loses magnitude and the overall experience is less immersive. Nonetheless, the danza community considers drummers danzantes as well. Shiwi, a 32-year-old danzante who doesn't dance but drums, explains how playing the drum has shaped his relationship with nature. When we're doing mansa, like I honor even the sticks that I'm using that are made out of wood. Like I think about them as like they were once a tree, it was once a living piece of an organism, and I honor it and I take care of them and I, I make sure that you know they're not mistreated because even though they're they're no longer part of a living thing that's contributing to us being able to perform. So I think. So his response tells us that even as drummers. They express similar ideas of how danza shapes their relationship with nature. After all, drumming is another bodily movement. While conducting this ethnography, I found most people made a strong correlation between what they considered sacred and ancestry. For some, danza becomes sac sacred once danzantes believe their ancestors embodied similar practices. Masa, a 24-year-old danzante with over four years of experience, describes this relationship through a story her grandfather shares. My grandfather has a mipa, you know, mm -hmm. and his backyard, and he, you were in the backyard, and he grabbed some, um, some uh, dirt, and he grabbed it and he showed it to me. He said, "You see this? This is where we come from." <coughs> The dirt. The dirt. He's like dirt, and he had corn. He had corn in the dirt, and he's like, mira, he's like, mira, mira. He, he put it in my hands and put it there, and he's like, mira, this is you, this is you, this is me, this is your mom, this is your grandmother. What? All these things that I do now are sacred. These are things that could have been taken away. These are things that I could have just been like, I don't want to do this. This is not me. But something in me told me, this is you. You have to do this. Masa, Masa's grandfather, whose father was also a danzante, captures this as the essence of this knowledge, an existential awareness that human life spawned from the earth and its sustenance. In this view, nature as a nurturing force is an original ancestor. An intuitive feeling of sacredness spawned within Masa after hearing her grandfather's story. And she describes this experience as a moment where her journey as a danzante gains existential sacred purpose. Humans emerge from the earth through a very nuanced and complex evolutionary process. But this maze and dirt analogy explained by Masa's grandfather emphasizes a simple yet fundamental relationship between humanity and earthly elements, offering a lens that allows us to reimagine and reconceptualize a universal ancestor. Al Alcoy, a 30-year-old danzante with 
over two years of experience expresses a similar correlation. In my opinion, the sacredness comes from the lessons or, or, or the community that is involved. Um, it is not um, solely on a dance or solely on the medicine. While those do help, it goes on the um, possibly the lesson being taught by an elder or elders and the community that's around. That's what makes it sacred. Alan Coy believes that sacredness of Dansa comes from the generational knowledge that is shared within the community. A knowledge that is facilitate, facilitated through a communal space, the Danza Mexicayo space. In conclusion, my research provides narrative-based evidence that Danza Mexicayo does in fact encourage an ecologically conscious awareness. It also suggests that Danzantes correlate notions of sacredness with concepts of ancestry. And because Danza Mexicayo is rooted in ancient Mexicayo traditions, the practice itself was considered sacred by all participants. Imagining sacred ecology means that danzantes can rewire their senses to recognize sacred ecology by consistently practicing in danza mexicano. And because they perceive the practice to be rooted in ancestry, it essentially generates perceptions of sacredness through an ecologically conscious imagination. As a note for my, as a note for my research, it did have some limitations, including discussions around the way um, groups organize and the gender themes within danza. But that work is covered extensively by Dr. Luna and Dr. Colleen. Um, still, this ethnography contributes to the fields of Chicanic studies by expanding on how indigeneity and indigenous cultural practices generate a critical observation of, eco of ecological environment, sacred spaces, and how they experience natural environment in relation to their bodies. It gives credit to the, to the idea that corporeal movements are transmitters of knowledge and a source of resistance for colonized bodies. I hope to expand on the limited work regarding Danza Mexicayo so that literature engaging concepts of embodied performances include those of the Mexicayo tradition. Although I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist as well, I suppose, my embodied experience really is a Chicano studies lens. Finally, I just like to say Plaso Camati, thank you to the Department of Chicano Studies, the honors program, um, Sebastian, thank you. Um, my mentor, Professor Dia Sanchez, thank you um, for guiding and supporting my research. I appreciate all of you, and I also want to thank um, the ERCA grant who funded it, and um, my cohort, the Honors Cohort, who has been very supportive, and all the Lanza community who has um, helped me co-create this research. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Ricardo? Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for your, uh, for your work. I find it really interesting because um, I'm also looking at doing an ethnography of dance. Um, and so I'm wondering, did you find in your interviews any points of contention where um, participants were disagreeing and reading things differently? And if so, what are some examples? Yes. Yeah, so one thing I definitely want to know is I... When I asked them, um, I had a question in there that wanted to wanted, I wanted to gauge how you know, this idea of a nature enthusiast, like, are you a nature enthusiast, right? And so I asked this question to, to somebody who grew up with a strong uh, native cultural heritage. And so to him, it felt that that question was somehow separating nature from, you know, the, the whole scheme of life. And so that's something that, that did come up. Um, maybe when you're talking to indigenous communities, the idea of of nature enthusiasts is not is it you know may not apply because it, it it kind of suggests that nature is something that that's consumable, you know you're yeah. just into it you know yeah. so so there was that contention um, and some people did say that they were green still and so they you know um, they hadn't reached that point where they they thought about, about this yeah but for the most yeah. yeah I have a thank you. It was a great project. Um, just quickly, you talked about the beginning your own trajectory about what led you to move, like literally in this direction. So, did you also ask that to other folks that you interviewed? Yeah, 
I uh, for the most part, yeah, I, that was one of the questions. I had ten questions, and one of them was what drew what drew them to them. Some of them had grown up around that community for a long time, but never actually did it until they were a little older. And I dove into the different reasons why. And everyone does have their different point of entry. Um, but yeah, there were there were there was a lot in terms of people trying to find their origins in a sense. Thank you so much, Ricardo. All right, our next presenter is Fabian Pavon. Namesha Palos, Nen Otoka, Fabian Pavon. It's good to meet you all. My name is Fabian Pavon. I am majoring in Chicanx studies. I am a second year transfer student from Mount San Antonio College. I was born and raised in the city of Pomona, which is in the Los Angeles area. Growing up, I was always getting into trouble. I was constantly suspended from school. I used to gangbang as a youth. I would use, buy, and sell drugs, and I would even use, buy, and sell guns. The only reason I would go to school was to sell drugs, talk to girls, and fight with my rival gang members until I ended up in jail. I grew up around these sorts of things, in addition to the negative stereotypical images of Mexicans as gang members in the media. I began to think that this is what it meant to be Chicano, and that my future consisted of gang banging, jail, and an early grave. I was completely turned off from school, but one day, my world history teacher in the 10th grade began to talk about the Mexican Revolution. When he described how Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa stood up for the poorest of the poor, fought against the people in power, and were succeeding against all odds, I remember thinking to myself, Mexicans do good things. I found myself becoming engaged with the material for the first time. I developed an interest in learning more about my roots and I began to keep myself busy by learning more about my history and about my culture. In a way, ethnic studies and more specifically, Chicana OX studies saved my life and gave me a reason to pursue higher education. I understand the power and responsibility of Chicana OX studies firsthand. Un uncovering my history has empowered me to create change. And this is why I am drawn to this particular research topic, which is a people's history of UC Santa Barbara, asserting space and place in a predominantly white institution. In the upcoming slides, I will be covering the background significance of my project, my research questions, methodology, UCSB's majoritarian narrative, instances of students asserting their space and place on this campus, then I will conclude and share my contribution with to Chicano X studies. Memorials and place names are highly contested. Embedded within them are often majoritarian stories, stories that glorify elites, typically wealthy, straight, and white men. Here at UCSB, that landscape is dotted with buildings that are named after the city's power elite. For example, we have Stork Tower, we have the Mosher Alumni House, and we have Cheeto Hall. All these buildings are named after white men, thus erasing all the contributions of people of color, women, and so on. Student activists of color transformed the university by consistently challenging racism, sexism, homophobia, and other systems of inequality for decades, both on and off campus. They have advocated for greater student input in particular governing decisions and demanded spaces and places where they could assert their dignity in a predominantly white institution. The questions that help guide my research are the following. What is the dominant historical narrative pertaining to UCSB? How is the dominant narrative reproduced through UCSB's physical space? What social movements and activism led by people of color and underrepresented groups took place at UCSB, and how is this history preserved and reproduced? I conducted 10 interviews. I interviewed UCSB alumni from different generations as far back as the 1970s who were active in social movements on campus. I also interviewed student activists currently attending UCSB. 
In addition, I drew from newspaper articles and press releases by student organizations who have presented demands to the administration. Through Kelly's official UCSB history, the majoritarian story of UCSB has been constructed. Essentially, Kelly credits the definite shaping of the university from its beginning to its end to those with racial and class privilege. The majoritarian narrative Kelly offers belittles the contributions of students of color. The language he uses when describing the needs of students of color throughout his book depicts them more as a nuisance and troublemakers rather than significant contributors in what made UCSB what it is today. The students of UCSB offer a perspective alternate of that of Kelly's. Yolanda Garcia was a first year Chicanic student at UCSB in 1966. Moreover, she recalled encountering only 11 other Chicanic students by 1967, her sophomore year. One day in her sophomore year, Garcia met with six other Chicanx Latinx students in the quad area of building 434. They formed an organization called United Mexican American Students, UMAS, and were successful in hiring William Villa as EOP's first Chicanx counselor in 1968. Subsequently, in 1969, these same students organized a statewide conference that took place in the Francisco Torres Residence Hall, now known as Santa Catalina Student Housing. The conference produced a 155-page document known as El Plan de Santa Barbara, which was sent to the administration. The document outlines recruitment and retention programs for Chicanx studies, instituting Chicanx studies and course material. The document led to the creation of Chicanx Studies Departments and Research Centers across campuses. As a result, the Chicanx Studies Department began to offer its first courses at UCSB in the fall of 1970. On January 1st, 1970, Bill Villa opened the doors to Building 406, which housed Chicano EOP, La Colección Tloque Nahuaque, the Institute for Chicanx Studies, the Chicanx Studies Department, and the newly formed Mecha Student Organization. Although this seemed like a victory, the building was only meant to exist temporarily. For decades, students had to, con had to constantly defend this space and their place on campus. One example is in 1994 when the new student, when the new extension of the library was supposed to destroy El Centro. However, Governor Pete Wilson's budget cuts to education temporarily halted this project. El Congreso members that met at El Centro felt that their presence on campus was being threatened. On April 27, 1994, nine congresistas went on a hunger strike right in front of Cheeto Hall, commemorated by that plaque right there. One of their demands was to make Building 406 a permanent building on campus. A couple of the results were that the campus officials agreed to consult with El Congreso before removing El Centro. They also considered a proposal to rename Building 406 to a Centro Arnulfo Casillas. They also agreed to hire more full-time faculty in the Chicanx Studies Department and to create a PhD program in Chicanx Studies. 24 years later, a Centro Arnulfo Casillas existence came into question yet once again. The building was highly ignored and left poorly maintained by the university for years. On January 2017, a congresista received an email stating that the students had 45 days to vacate the premises due to dry rot under the building that put students in danger if an earthquake were to occur. Congresistas and alumni called meetings with the administration and held them accountable for letting the building get into its current state by ignoring decades of maintenance requests from students. Members of El Congreso and members from Students for Justice in Palestine demanded that the administration renovate the space and update the building into the 21st century. As a result, the administration spent about $1 million in renovations with student input every single step of the way. Throughout the decade, students asserted their place and turned El Centro Arnulfo Casillas into a space of resistance on campus. Chicanx Latinx students were not the only ones who asserted their place and created spaces of resistance on campus, however. Black students held UCSB accountable and challenged institutional racism. On October 14, 1968, 12 members of the Black Student Union took over the computer center at North Hall and renamed it Malcolm X Hall. Moreover, these students threatened to destroy the computers inside the building that contained highly sensitive and irreplaceable student records. The Black Student Union felt that a stand must be taken for the racism Black athletes experienced as a result of racist coaches. 
They also took it as an opportunity to bring attention to the institutionalized racism all black students experienced on campus. They barricaded themselves inside the building for nine and a half hours by blocking the doors with desks, chairs, and tables. Some of the demands that were agreed upon included the development of a college of black studies with black instructors and a graduate program in Afro-American studies. They also agreed to hire more black folks in administrative and managerial positions and also to hire more black faculty and counselors. Like Chicanx Latinx students, for decades, black students challenged racism on campus and asserted their space and place. However, conditions for black students hardly changed until recently. Former BSU member Alexis Wright argued that by 2013, the population of black students had not risen a 4%, which showed that there was indeed a problem on campus. She also observed that there was about 500 black students in her freshman class, but there were only 60 students in her black graduation ceremony. Wright noticed that she was rarely in a classroom where a great number of black students were present until she started taking black studies classes. This goes to show that even though the demands were agreed, up, agreed upon in 1968, the administration did not hold themselves accountable to follow through on all of the students' demands. In 2013, students from the Black Student Union met up with the administration with a new set of demands. The chancellor admitted that many of the demands made in 1968 had not been addressed. According to BSU press release from December 13, 2013, Chancellor Liang agreed to do the following. To authorize the hiring of, the council, of a counselor for diversity initiatives to recruit more black students, to authorize the hiring of psychologists with experience working with black students and commit and he also committed to raising over $2 million to hire four endowed, endowed chairs across academic divisions. It is worth noting that in 2013, the BSU demanded that North Hall be renamed to Malcolm X Hall. But instead, Chancellor Yang allowed panels to be installed to commemorate the historic and courageous North Hall takeover of 1968. North Hall became a space of resistance where black students asserted their space and place in a predominantly white institution. LGBTQ students have also had a long history of challenging homophobia, asserting their space and place and creating a safe environment for students to come out and be who they are. In 1970, the Gay Student Union was established at UCSB. And in 1971, the Gay Student Union is named the Gay People's Union in order to include the community and not just students. The goals of the GPU consisted of increasing gay student visibility on campus, providing educational services to all students and community members, and providing alternative social outlets for gay students. In 1982, the Gay People's Union is renamed the Gay and Lesbian Student Union in order to be even more inclusive. For decades, LGBTQ students asserted their space and place on campus and pushed for an institutionalized space. On October 23rd, 1998, about 1,500 students marched towards Cheeto Hall and presented demands to Chancellor Yang, which resulted in the creation of the Queer Resource Center. The Queer Resource Center is opened in 1999, and in 2001, the name of the Queer Resource Center changes to the Resource Center for Sexuality and Gender Diversity in order to be more inclusive of the population that it serves. In 2007, the RCSGD was moved from the USEN to the Student Resource Building. This new safe space that was asserted by the students and institutionalized allowed for more students to feel safe enough to come out of the shadows and form more organizations. For example, in 2008, La Familia de Colores was formed, which is an organization for Chicanx, Latinx, LGBTQ plus students. And that same year, Black Queer was founded, which, which is an organization for, pe for people who identify as Black or African and also identify as LGBTQ plus. <coughs> On November 17, 2017, the RCSGD student staff presented a list of demands to the administration and claimed that the women gender and sexual equity department did not treat them fairly. This, the student staff uh, referenced a November 14 incident when the center's associate director was fired and removed from the student resource building by police and without warning. As a result, the RCSGD was moved out from under the jurisdiction of the WGSE and the RCSGD will have its budget doubled in order to add more needed resources for LGBTQ plus students and in addition, a new independent building for a new RCSGD is currently being considered by the administration. In conclusion, 
It is because of the contributions of student activists of color that UCSB has been consistently uh, has been consistently pushed to feed the needs of the diverse student population. Learning this history creates a model for future student activists to continue to battle the systems of inequality. This is why it is important that their con that their contributions be researched, acknowledged, shared, and preserved. Originally, the Chicana OX Studies Department was created to use the resources of this colonial institution to give back and power and change our community, therefore changing our world altogether. Chicanx Latinx students have some of the lowest rates of degree attainment. My research contributes to Chicana OX studies by allowing it to add to the greater body of work that we call ethnic and gender studies, which has been proven to reduce dropout rates, improve grades, and close the achievement gap among Chicanx, Latinx, and white high school students. By creating, preserving, and sharing new knowledge about our history uh, of our community, we are placing the history that was stripped from our ancestors and the history that continues to be denied to us back into the hands of the youth creating the potential to change the world. Tlazokamati to my family for being here today. Tlazokamati to the Chicana OX Studies Department. Tlazokamati to my dear mentor, Dr. Ralph Armbruster Sanibal. Tlazokamati. Yes? So she asked, who is Kelly? So I was talking about Robert Kelly. So Robert Kelly wrote a book about Santa Barbara, and he doesn't talk about, about Chicanas or Chicanos or black folks. He, he When he talks about them, he talks about, that's a great question. When he talks about them, when he talks about them, he doesn't really talk about them as helping the school. He kind of talks about them as disrupting the school, even though we help the school a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I just have a comment. I hope you go into organizing or teaching because you have such a wonderful presence when you speak. It's, it's just vibrates in the room. I think it just stirs everybody. So I really hope you take advantage of that gift. Thank you, Fabian, so much for, for your work. And one of the things I have always appreciated about the witnessing your uh, scholarship, but also your activism, is again the way that you, I don't know if seamlessly is the right word, but how you link the struggles between Black students, Chicanx students, queer students, in a way that doesn't seem forced, right? It's as if people were having these conversations on the ground. Um, and so thank you for, for sharing uh, also those incredible archival photos. And, and I and I can't wait to see where this project goes. So thank you so much for your work. All right, our next presenter is Sarah Romero Martinez. So, Good evening, everybody. <laughs> my name is Sarah Romero Martinez, and today I'll be presenting my research project titled Unveiling True Potentials Overcoming Challenges of Prisoner Reentry. Generally, we send individuals to prison to be punished, to prevent them from committing more crimes, and to deter others from breaking the law. For the most part, we tend to perceive our inmate population as something very detached from our society. Given that millions of prisoners are released each year, you would think that rehabilitation will probably be one of the most important aspects of our prison system. But unfortunately, it's not. We are really good at punishment, though. In fact, America has about 5% of the world's total population, but holds 25% of the world's prisoners. This makes the United States the country with the highest incarceration rate in the world. We are so focused on retribution and punishment, but we fail to realize that locking our prisoners away will only mean we'll have to address the circumstances that led to their delinquency later on. 
In fact, 95% of our imprisoned population will be released to rejoin society. Now, given there are many misconceptions on what re-entry is like. Movies and TV shows portray it as a happy moment when friends and families reunite and inmates get their lives back together. But the sad truth is that 70, the 76%, meaning over two thirds of our released population will be rearrested and 50% 50, 50 will return to a prison cell just five years after leaving prison. Sorry, there were some technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> All right, round two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, as I was saying, um, so 95% of our prison population will be released to rejoin society. Now, there are many misconceptions on what reentry is like. Movies and TV shows portrayed as a happy moment when friends and families reunite and inmates get their life back together. But sad truth is that 76%, meaning two thirds of our released population will be rearrested and over 50% will return to a cell within just five years of leaving prison. Given these statistics, our country is investing so much money, spending over $52 billion a year on an experiment that fails over half the time. That didn't make sense to me, which is exactly what led me to this research project. So the purpose of the study was to examine the obstacles that individuals face during the reentry process. I wanted to understand why our nation has such a high recidivism rate. So I looked at the challenges that prisoners face when they were released, what resources, if any, they were given, and how well prepared they were for this process while incarcerated. I also, and also, what factors do contribute to a successful reentry process, since evidently our prison system isn't doing a very good job. So I interviewed nine per, uh, separate participants who had been all incarcerated for separate reasons and at different stages of their lives. All their names have been anonymized throughout, throughout this presentation. I asked about their experiences through their childhood, imprisonment, and reintegration process coming back into society. Throughout my interviews, I began to notice a pattern in the underlying causes that drove individuals to participate in delinquency in the first place. Like you're about to hear, many expressed having a tough upbringing, being raised in violent households with drug addicted parents, domestic violence, and gang involved families. Um, my life was rough. I grew up, grew, grew up in an abusive household. Um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse was rampant. Um, physical mental abuse was also in the home. Domestic violence 
From a young age, I experienced a lot. I got involved in games, but we never 12 years old. Um, started getting high when I was uh, 12. As soon as I joined the gang, I was like uh, drinking at school every day, getting high at school every day. You know, that type of lifestyle. So I gravitated towards that because that's all I know. That's all I've seen in my home. And I was accepted. And that's what we did. That's what my family did. That's what I've seen. So that's what I did. Growing up in this type of environment heavily influenced decisions that were made at an early age. Individuals began to normalize that lifestyle, and like Roy expressed, they sought out the only path they knew. Along the same line. Oh, my life was rough. Seven of my participants were gang affiliated and joined because of the exposure that they had to gang culture throughout their family and peers. As you'll, ex as you'll see in these next two clips, they merely follow the traditions and lifestyle that have been displayed in front of them throughout their childhood. My brother got killed in February 2015. A few of my friends got killed within like weeks after. Then my best friend got killed in December 2015 right outside of my house. So everybody I've ever associated with, surrounded myself with, they've either been part of a game or a family. You know? So it, it's always been around me and living in LA is, is part of the culture, you know. The gang and the street culture were raised me. You know, that's what I could have been. I was raised and brought up in the gang lifestyle. You know, it was a lifestyle that I was brought into. So it was around me all the time. And, you know, back then I was trying to get the attention from my dad. You know, now when I think back, now I know like he couldn't do it. He was a drug addict. He was an you know. But I wanted his attention. I wanted his, you know, love. And, you know what I mean? Um, and being a gang member, that's what actually like, problem with actually be a gang member. So, no, Although everyone had their own reasons for seeking membership into a gang, the most common were the sense of support, acceptance, and protection that gang can provide for their members. Now looking back, they understand they had the, to seek these social aspects through specific outlets because they were not receiving it from their families or from school institutions. My brother. So especially me, the family they came from. Another significant impact in their childhood was having family members that had previously been incarcerated or system involved. The disruption that comes with parental incarceration had damaging effects on the development of eight of my interviewees. Here, Jerry describes his family's deep involvement in the system, how he felt a need to continue his family's legacy because he was the only one that was left. So especially me, the family, I guess it, it I guess it, so especially me, the family they came from, I came from a really good family in the neighborhood. So at the time, my uncle was really in federal prison, my cousin was in federal prison, and uh, my brother moved to my cousin's dad. So I was, the, I was the last one for visiting the family. So I had a reputation to, to So to me, prison was fun. It was like, I was trained for it. And it was, to me, it was just somewhere to neighbor and just, um, you know, just have fun, just make money, gang money, and just have fun. Now, when I asked about the reentry process, I noticed a few problems. When an individual is taken away from their community, placed under 24-hour surveillance, there should be a responsibility to ensure that this formative period of their lives is used to reform them, not into participating in the same behaviors and situations that led to prison. You would think that from the moment they step into a cell, they would be exposed to a supportive environment different from the lifestyle that brought them in. But like you're about to hear, that isn't the case in prison. I guess it, it, in that environment, um, conformity is a must, and you're gonna follow it because you want you don't want to choose to stand out because they're probably gonna whack you. Uh, being in prison, um, 
it's crazy because everybody there's like literally survival mode. You know, like um, I look at you, you look at me, but my, my thoughts are like enemy. I don't know. It's just a really harsh environment. You know, um, there's not really anything positive going on in the yard. And they like you can raise your hand one day and say, hey, you know what? I want to change. I want to go to school. I want a career. I want a wife. I want Jesus. No. You get yourself into the rule again, you join. So that's what I mean by you take a bunch of kids, you put them on a, on a prison yard, expect them to self help each other. It's like the blind leading the blind, you know? Yeah. It's just like this really big cycle of madness. When you're in prison, I just try to straddle like, be choosy about what I do, uh, watch slow, think fast, get harder, just stay focused, you know? Because anything can happen. And you know what? I swear, it's like walking an eggshell, constantly like, living under fear. So prisoners are put in a hostile, disconnected space, which make it impossible for them to address the issues that led to them, to them being confined. Because instead of focusing on changing, they need to concentrate on how to survive. I get this type of mentality and environment continues until prisoners are moved from a cell and all of a sudden given complete freedom. They are immediately exposed to the same situations and temptations that got them there in the first place. Although they serve time and are punished for what they did wrong, nothing is being done to help deter them from that type of activity again. They are released to face the same barriers, the same type of neglect and violence, but this time with a mark on their record. I think it was a more of a fight to stay free than it was to get out. And that's the sad part. I don't think that the system is designed to rehabilitate you. Like rehabilitation, you think of the worst ability. They don't give you nothing prior to getting out to ensure you have stability. Like when you get out, you don't have education, you don't have no source of income, no stable housing, no California driver's license, no ID, no social security number, no work ethics. Really big record at $200 to get money. Good luck. I think it was. A like he expressed, many leave underprepared and have to navigate reentry on their own. An obstacle shared in all interviews identified experiencing hardships finding employment. Because of background checks and questions about the crime committed, they still live with the consequences of their crime even after they paid their debt to society. Another issue I noticed was stereotyping based off their appearances, which had been a daily occurrence in their lives even before prison, but it was only made worse after. Most of the interviews described being specifically targeted by police because of their record, even if they weren't doing anything wrong. For example, in this quote, Roy was released and was trying to set his life straight, but by the time that he was doing that, he was already a known gang member and would constantly be pulled over for the slightest thing, like walking down the street with his friends. Other issues that come up, including substance addictions, mental health issues, and while some had access to counseling for alcoholism or drugs, that didn't always reflect upon reentry. Surprisingly to me, mental health was actually a significant barrier. In actuality, many undergo depression throughout this reentry period because of the stress they face due to lack of resources available to them. Four interviewees expressed undergoing depressive episodes while trying to come to terms with their past. And unfortunately, because a felony automatically disqu disqualifies you from receiving certain types of government assistance, seeking help through counseling is oftentimes too expensive and out of reach. <coughs> Overall, I found that imprisonment is not successful because it fails to fix the issues that inmates face outside of the real world, like lack of opportunities and access to education, poverty, homelessness. So instead of focusing so much on locking these individuals away, prison policy should concentrate on addressing the social disadvantages that lead to delinquency. Our MA population is one of the most underprepared populations that we have in our country. In fact, 40% of them lack a high school education and only 16% have a high school diploma. Instead of spending so much money on a failing system, we should invest on providing more opportunities that will reflect, effectively rehabilitate. For example, in my interviews, I found that Community-based organizations such as Homeboy Industries actually do much more to help an individual than, than being in prison. Aside from literally ha handing them jobs, Homeboy Industries caters to the need of those who are striving to change their lives for the better. They have substance abuse counselors and programs, personal development workshops, and parenting trainings that provide their members with any materials they need. They also offer tattoo removal services that get rid of visible tattoos that prevent employment. Ultimately, this organization understands that their members have faced and will continue to face conflicts in their communities even after they're released. Therefore, they provide them with tools necessary to overcome any setbacks that they may encounter. So, uh, 
like homeboys, it, it just gives a lot of people hope, you know, like, and it gives, people say it's like their second chance for a lot of people is their first and only chance, you know, because homeboys is actually investing in an individual that people neglected and demonized, you know, for a long time, you know, and there's opportunities that rise up for, for homies and homegirls at homeboy machines, and it's, we're all helping one another. It's like we're not we're not better than nobody, but we're not less than nobody, you know. Right here we understand that you're not gonna change overnight. And then we get to our community like love, kinship, connection, validation, appreciation, acceptance, all the good things that the majority of us didn't experience as a child, like nourishment. So we kinda of built you back up here, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was this place that did it for me. So uh, like home with Another solution that I discovered were educational programs that are provided by community colleges. Santa Barbara City College has its transition program that seeks out formerly incarcerated individuals and gives them a smooth transition between prison and community college. They are able to interact with faculty and, and are provided assistance in financial aid. Overall, establish a support system between their cohort of students. Like Roy will describe, programs like this allow education to become a transformative power that ultimately deters them from a prison cell. Programs like Transitions can change their histories of when these individuals were originally pushed out of school institutions to them being welcomed in with guidance and a support network. Our success here at City College has like, I saw people in the year, like the year and a half that I've been out of prison, I've accomplished so much in this year and a half than I've ever accomplished. And I tell people, like, what I have now, I'd be stupid to go back to like that I was living before. I've, I've been reborn. Everything that I've gone through, I've put myself through, has happened in my life. It's all led up to this moment. I've already been at rock bottom, you know? I've already been to the bottom of the pit. Now it's kind of, you know, all I've got is to go up and, and be as great as I can. You know, and that's the mission that I'm headed towards. You know, that's the mission that I want. I realized through my interviews that education and networks provided by community-based programs like Homeboy Industries and Transitions all became important factors to the success of an individual's reentry process. In a sense, these opportunities and resources allowed them to change their perceptions on themselves and acknowledge their abilities to persevere. All the people I interviewed expressed a feeling of self-determination and continue to strive to better themselves and serve as examples to those whose shoes they once filled. Overall, this project allowed me and hopefully you all to better understand the factors that contribute to the in and out cycling of our prison population and the need to reform our failing system in order to provide these individuals with the right programs they need to change. Instead of, instead of investing on prison cells, we need to take the we need to take into consideration actual solutions that will not only prevent crime, but will successfully rehabilitate one of our nation's most disadvantaged populations. I just want to say thank you to my advisor, Dr. Victor Rios, the Chicana Studies Honors Department, and our TA, Sebastian, and also the ARCA grant for allowing this uh, research project to become a reality, and ultimately also um, Home by Industries and the Transitions Program for entrusting in me their stories and allowing me to interview their individuals. <laughs> Talk a little bit about this, the experience of interviewing um, these individuals and sort of what that was like for your research challenges or affirmations or just reflections that experience. Mm. Well, I was lucky enough to actually get in contact with um, through my advisor with the transitions coordinator. So um, they were very welcoming. They wanted they wanted me to tell their stories. Um, when it came to homeboys, I think uh, an obstacle was. Mm. Well, my, my audio is actually like very, very um, loud uh, when it like background noise. So like that was a really big obstacle. But aside from that, they were very, they were very, very welcoming. I um, I'm like, I, I think there's like really big misconceptions on the stigma that follows these individuals. But like if given the right resources, like they, they can 
excel even like further than any expectation that was set upon them. And I think I really like appreciated the resilience inside of them. Like that's something that I don't think I've seen in a, in a, in a, in a, like, a really long time. So um, this whole process was like really just eye opening. And that's something that I definitely want to continue um, doing in the future. Do you have any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to our last presentation. Um, we have Marisol Vargas. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marisol Vargas. I am a fourth year Chicana Chicano Studies major, minoring in, minoring in education and applied psychology. I am very thrilled to be up here today um, to be sharing with you my research project, Factors in Overcoming Emotional Difficulties, Latina College Students' Mental Health and Wellbeing. This topic is very near and dear to my heart because I have to overcome emotional difficulties during my time here at ACSB. The adversities I have overcame have led me to find my passion for higher education, and I now aspire to be part of the student affairs profession. Therefore, the purpose of my study aligns closely with my passion. The purpose of my study is to better understand the ways that female college participants who identify as Latina cope with emotional difficulties while navigating a post-secondary institution in hopes to use the knowledge and research acquired to improve student services for Latina college students and students of color at the University of California, Santa Barbara. My study, my study focuses on Latina college students' mental health because very little, little research has been conducted about this group. It is expected that concentrated on Latinas will add to our understanding of mental health that is particular to the segment of the college population. So before I jump into my study, I want to share with you some background on Latinas in higher education. At 54 million, Latinos now make up the largest ethnic minority in the country. Currently, one in five women in the U.S. is a Latina. One in four female students in public schools across the nation is a Latina. Projections are that by 2060, Latinas will form nearly a third of the female population of the nation. Thus, the future of the nation is very much tied to the future of these women and girls. Although enrollment rates of Latinas in post-secondary education have increased in the United States, graduation rates have not followed the same trend. The discrepancy between enrollment and graduation rates may be explained by stressors that many Latina college students experience. As a group, Latinas begin school significantly behind other females and without ad adequate resources and support. They are never able to catch up to their peers. Latinas graduate from high school at lower rates than any major subgroup more than one in five has not completed high school by age 29. Latinas are also the least likely of all women to complete a college degree at just 19% compared to nearly 44% of white women. Recent studies focus on the educational gaps between men and women, especially men and women of color. These studies highlight how Latinas are graduating from high school at higher rates than their male counterparts, and 60% of bachelor's degrees earned by Latinos go to women. So why focus my study on Latinas? Although Latina females are out, outperforming Latino males educationally, they still have the lowest high school graduation and some of the lowest college completion rates of all women. Most importantly, they report higher levels of stress and distress than Latinos and their non-Latina counterparts. My study aims to answer how Latina college students cope with a mental illness while navigating a post-secondary institution. Additionally, it looks at how Latina's mental health is linked to academic resilience. Prevalence and severity of mental health problems among college students has increased nationwide over the past several decades. According to the Nas National Alliance on Mental Illness, more than 25% of college students has been diagnosed or mis or treated by a professional for a mental health condition within the past year. The Latino community has strong beliefs of interconnectedness of the mind, body, and spirit. However, there's an underlying stigma in the Latino community when it comes to seeking mental health support. Latina college students experience significant stress and psychological distress in the college com campus context. They experience higher rates of depression and anxiety than Latino male students and non-Latina female students. 
but they often attribute their emotional distress to problemas de la vida. Mental health problems interfere with academic success, and Latinas report the lowest rate of co college completion among female, female college students. Although the growth in mental health problems on college campuses is not limited to one population, females continue to report higher rates of depression, anxiety, and eating disorders compared to males. Evidence suggests that Latinas are particularly at risk for problems associated with mental health. Before moving forward for the purpose of my presentation, I will be defining mental health and mental health stigma. Mental health can be defined as a person's condition with regard to their psychological and emotional well-being. It is often the psychological state of someone who is functioning at a satisfactory level of emotional and behavioral adjustment. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. Mental health stigma is defined as dehumanizing a person known to have or appearing to have a mental illness or disorder. A total of four female self-identified English-speaking Latina undergraduate students from the University of California, Santa Barbara participated in my study. Participants self-reported as experiencing and overcoming adversity, specifically having gone through some type of mental illness and recovered to continue their education. Participants ages range from 18 to 25 years. Participants were recruited through verbal announcements at campus groups weekly meetings, as well as via email sent through the group's mailing list. The announcements and emails sent briefly described the study, informing potential participants of their rights and requesting participation. Selection criteria included self-identifying as Latina, having experienced a self-defined adversity, and reporting having overcome that adversity. For the purpose of this study, I created a demographic questionnaire in order to acquire information about participant characteristics to give context for interpreting results. The questionnaire asked about such variables as gender, age, generational status, and Latina, Latino subculture, identifying specifically as Mexican, Guatemalan, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Costa Rican, Salvadorian, or other. Ten open-ended questions made up the semi-structured interview protocol. These questions were created to explore participants' personal experiences with mental illness and their personal relationship with their mother. Questions included topics such as the participants' experience with overcoming adverse events and participants' experiences with mental illness. I was able to identify two primary, primary themes in my research study, barriers and resilience. I define barriers as a social, individual, or environmental phenomenon that hinders or restricts normal developmental achievement. In addition, I define re resilience as the ability to make normal developmental achievements despite obvious, adverse social and environmental barriers. In my study, I was also able to identify subcategories and tertiary categories within these primary themes. I will first be focusing on the primary theme of barriers. The first subcategory I was able to find under barriers was individual, which I define as conditions that affect only a few people or individuals. The tertiary category under this subcategory is cognitive, which I define as internal judgment ca causing distress and general stress. The second subcategory I identified under barriers is cross-cultural. I define cross-cultural as rules, regulations, or circumstances that affect groups of individuals operating within or between multiple societies. The tertiary category under the subcategory is acculturation, which is defined as difficulties that result from attempting to interact within two systems that have competing values and or cultures, including racism and discrimination. The final subcategory identified under the primary theme of barriers is systematic, which I define as rules, regulations, or circumstances that affect groups or of individuals operating with the, within the same society. Additionally, I was able to identify two tertiary categories, societal convention, which I define as values, practices, or role expectations perceived to be held of a broad social environment and microsystem, which is defined as systems which perpetuate role expectations for a small group organization, such as family, community, school, or work environment. In order to better understand the identified theme of barriers, today I will be sharing with you Daniela's story. Daniela is a third year student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, originally from South Central California, who has coped with bipolar disorder, disorder, depression, and anxiety throughout her undergraduate career. 
Daniela is, Daniela is a first-generation college student, the eldest in her family from Salvadorian and Mexican descent. Okay, I'll just be reading her quote. Um, apologies. Um, being in a very white institution like that definitely took a toll. Just because, like, it's very obvious you're not wanted here, very obvious. I was like, my first year, I remember those chalkings, Make America Great Again, built a wall, and I was like, oh, wow. So they don't, they, so they don't. Okay. I go outside and I be. And I would see like Nazi posters and shit everywhere. Or every now and then, you know, there's very clear indications that like you are not wanted here and you do not belong here. So it's just like a constant, like occupying space, resisting this by just being here. But it like gets exhausting. Although um, her story is unique, Daniela also shared with me multiple systematic barriers that many Latinas experience. She talked about stigma um, and how seeking treatment was really, really difficult and how um, there's an inadequate access to mental health. Um, but what really caught my attention was the unique experience that Latina college students face um, when it comes to mental health, such as the role their institution plays. Daniela expressed the role that the institution she attended played with the emotional distress she was experiencing. Latina college students are not immune to discrimination experiences on college campuses. Racial discrimination amongst Latinas has been li linked to significant negative health outcomes, including anxiety, depression, and psychological distress. Perceived racial discrimination is subjective experience of being treated unfairly based on one's race. This is one aspect of race system that has been identified as a psychological stressor with significant mental and behavioral health consequences for ethnic minorities, including college students. Latina college students report being overly stereotyped and singled out based on their linguistic skills, accent, country of origin, immigration status, and their physical characteristics. The internalization of negative feedback about the self are the mechanisms that underline the perceived discrimination linked with psychological and behavioral systems. Symptoms, sorry. Not only does this place them at risk for academic problems, but the internalization of negative racial stereotypes and encounters also affects their mental health. The second primary theme I identified in my study is resilience. Once again, I define resilience as the ability to, be, to make normal developmental achievements despite obvious adverse social and environmental barriers. Within this theme, I was able to identify a subcategory, positive attitudes, which I define as an internal perspective, which causes circumstances to be viewed in a favorable means. Additionally, within this subcategory, I was able to identify a tertiary category, hope, which is the belief that future expectations will be met and that there exists explicit or implied both ability and means. Um, so this student whose name was Amy, who is a first year student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, expressed, it comes as it sets of difficulties and you go through experiences that it sucks, that you had to go through them. But I try to look at everything as a learning experience. <clears throat> After the statement, she shared with me her admiration for everything she had accomplished during her time at UCSB, how her passion for learning about her culture through the Chicano Studies Department motivates her for her future, and how her experiences have encouraged change and growth within her. Um, Amy is one of many participants that showcase resilience in form of positive attitudes like hope. Um, all right, I'll see. So the results of my study indicate the further research on Latinas' experiences with overcoming emotional distress and need to better understand their educational trajectory in order for post-secondary institutions to improve student services. Um, so some future recommendations, I would 
like to continue this study and do a mixed methods approach. I would also like to focus on the transfer experience, look closely at two year and private institutions, and as well as interview the um, mothers to see the role they play within their daughter's lives. I would also like to elaborate on what institutions um, have been doing, for example, four years, which is what my study focused on. Contribution to the Chicano Department. Um, I think my study is very important for faculty to become more aware of the unique experiences that Latinas and all students within their department are facing and how it's affecting their mental health. Um, many of my peers asked, challenged you today to think in, um, and in a different perspective. And I challenge you to take those challenges because every single um, research study that was conducted um, and what my peers focused on would really help my research study and would really um, help us look closely at what how we can improve mental health um, services here on campus and how we can help um, our students that live in our department to have a healthy way of co a healthier way of coping with um, a mental mental illness and distress. I would like to extend my appreciation and gratitude to the Chicano Studies Department for this wonderful opportunity, to my faculty advisor, Dr. Morgan Consoli, um, to my cohort advisor, Sebastian, for the guidance, um, to my honors cohort for the support, and to my familia for coming out here from Visalia to support me. Thank you. <laughs> showcase how often students um, like Latinas um, feel excluded from here, that they don't belong, that this, this isn't their home. Um, so when that was happening, the student that brought up that um, experience, the whole riding on the sidewalk, um, she, she said that it was her first time being on campus and seeing that it made her feel very sad and feel like she didn't belong here. Um, I think I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> time for another question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of the um, honors students who presented such interesting interdisciplinary work today. Again, a special thank you to Sebastian Ferrada for guiding these students throughout the year. I think um, I think it's important to also to really acknowledge the fact that U.S. students want to go into so many fields from educators to community organizers to policy makers in the case of Daniel. Um, so, and also, you know, to, to think about the work that Marisol is embarking on in terms of student affairs and mental health. So we sort of see the breadth of careers that these students are going to embark upon. The next uh, part of our program is um, to present the undergraduate awards. So I'm going to hand the mic to my colleague, Dr. Ines Casillas. make sure that everybody is here before we start. Marco, um, Haroseth, yay, uh, Danny, yay, Nefti I saw earlier, and via Micaela, here, okay, great. Uh, so we have this wonderful tradition of recognizing five students who, for particular reasons, are just not presenting a research project this year or chose not to do it, but as a faculty and a department, we feel we should recognize them and honor them. Um, we have a tradition where we just began last year where we choose an artist to give as a quote unquote award rather than a plaque, a print. Last year, we chose um, the Chicano artist Eric Almanza, who focuses a lot on U.S.-Mexico 
order. This year we chose Angelica de Seda. She, this is a print that we chose of Sandra Cisneros from Angelica Becerra's Palabra series. The series includes um, also Angela Davis, Yuri Cocheyama, Bell Hooks, Gloria Anzaldúa, Juan Gabriel, and others. Angelica Becerra considers these images an offering to our elders whose activism has often been forgotten or erased in our larger imaginary. Her images and quotes she sees as acts of remembrance. Growing up in a Mexican and Latino household, elders are pillars in our community. They are honored and respected long after they have moved on. Anelica shares that she wanted to paint women in particular to remind ourselves and others that our current work and struggles are not the first. Women before us have built a foundation for many of the mo movements we take part in today. She painted the inspirational art in hopes that others would see themselves affirmed and empowered. Her work is a self-care practice, as a, well as a way to keep a queer brown activist politics alive. She is currently a graduate student at UCLA's Chicana and Chicano <laughs> Studies program, and she was beyond honored and thrilled when I ordered these prints and told her that they were gonna go to undergraduates. Mm -hmm. So it's a print and it's a quote from Sandra Cisneros that says, I put up with too much, too long, and now I'm just too intelligent, too powerful, too beautiful, too sure of who I am finally to deserve anything less. And Angelica Becerra also refers to Sandra Cisneros as our patron saint, the Chingonas. We thought we all could use this. So our first award is the Carlos Onales Service Award and recognition of dedicated, generous, and selfless campus and or community service. This goes this year to Marco Maradiaga, Marcos has been very active in Hermanos Unidos. He's been a peer advisor in our department. Before UCSB, he did a lot of organizing at Settle Back Community College. He's one of the few people that arrives at UCSB as a declared major, does not need to take the ABC series to come to Jesus, as some of you guys do. He is passionate about mentoring. One of my favorite kind of moments is kind of overhearing him speak to undergraduates in this very reassuring way about the major. And he is pursuing a future in educational policy. One more line about this. We recognize this award for community service, but this is certainly the first time that I believe we're awarding or recognizing one's generosity. He is just generous in his spirit. So congratulations. <laughs> Our second award is the Acevedo Memorial Spirit Award in recognition of dedication and perseverance in overcoming all odds to completing the degree. Our first recipient is Haroseth Mendoza. She is graduating this year as a triple major in Spanish, Latin American studies, and Chicana and Chicano Ooh. studies. She is thriving at UCB. UCSB as a proud immigrant, a Spanish dominant speaker, and someone who challenged our university's own racial climate years ago in a dispute over a grade. So many of us, me, Professor Ambrister Sandoval, who nominated her, develop, and so many of us have seen her develop at UCSB into an intellectual who, despite all familial and personal challenges, ha logrado with everything. So congratulations and thank you for your Our second recipient of the Spirit Award goes to Gabriel Danny Reyes. A first generation student like many, he did not feel he had much support from family or positive experiences with campus friends. At one point he considered dropping out of college because of the stress, but he decided to stay mainly because of family and community. It takes a special spirit, as we know, to be first generation queer and brown on this campus. Professor Hernandez, who nominated um, 
Danny, who also had the pleasure of having Danny, I believe in four of her courses, writes, quote, Danny said to me that majoring in Chicano and Chicano studies saved his life, and he will be graduating this spring 2018 with a degree in Chicano studies and Spanish. I nominate Danny because he represents the spirit of Ward for having an enduring fighting spirit to succeed in the midst of major challenges in his life. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next award is for Outstanding Undergraduate Academic Achievement in recognition of the undergraduate who is graduating um, with the highest overall grade point average in our major. And that this year goes to Micaela Rodriguez Tobar. A double major in sociology and Chicano and Chicano studies. She completed the honors program last year and is graduating with a 3.75 overall major, which is an accomplishment to do that with two majors. She also was a former peer advisor for us, and we all recognize her as somebody in our classes who did all the reading, every single page, and was very vital to discussion. So thank you, Micaela. <laughs> It wouldn't be this event if I didn't cry, because I cry every year. Um, and this last award, I have a very special recipient. I was hoping somebody else cried beforehand. I don't understand why I have to be the first one. This goes to Natalie Arceo. So my former honor student and former research assistant, um, it, she is receiving the award for the senior graduate school applicant with the most promise in recognition of outstanding potential to contribute to future knowledge through graduate education. Um, I had the privilege this year of writing a four-page letter of recommendation for an FD to graduate school and several awards, so I know a lot about her. I've consistently found Ms. Arceo that I write in my letter of recs to be independently motivated, attentive to feedback, and someone who truly enjoys learning. She demonstrates the intellectual curiosity, creativity, and commitment to her academic studies necessary to excel in graduate school. Ms. Sarceo was the second person in our department to ever complete the honors program during their junior year. Her decision to complete three academic majors, Spanish, Chicana, Chicana Studies, and an individualized major, which means she created it herself, called American Indian Indigenous Studies, in just four years and often by maintaining two jobs, certainly speaks to her intellectual curiosity. In my 10 years at UCSB, Ms. Sarceo is one of the best students I have ever had the pleasure of working with. This fall, she will begin a doctoral program in Native American Studies at UC Davis on fellowship. <laughs> graduation day <laughs> when you see the faculty there we love that day we do show up there with Kleenex because we have seen you guys grow the last two five some of you have struggled and been here seven years and we would not miss that day for the world it's one of our favorite days so Micaela's next to do the stools thank you so much hang around for the reception afterwards so we have one more part of our program before we enjoy this delicious food with a beautiful view as our backdrop. Yeah, I know we're all hungry. Thank you to everyone for um, for being here again. Gracias a las familias que vinieron desde lejos. Um, and so uh, now I would like to, um, with my uh, with the chair of our department, Gerardo Lodana, give the stoles to the honor students um, and. Um, 
I'd like to, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. Um, and we have uh, Daniel's uh, mentor here, Professor Castillo, so would you help us give this talk? So first we'd like to give our first honors program stall to Daniel Cortez Huerta. <laughs> Uh, next, we'd like to present a stall to Alondra Garcia Bedoya. Next, Ana Guerrero Gallego. Next, Jessica Jasmine Lopez Salazar. Uh, next, Ricardo Mata. <laughs> All right, next, Fabian Pavón. <laughs> next, Sara Romero Martínez. <laughs> All right, and finally, Marisol Vargas. And it's important to note that all of these students will have special distinctions in their on uh, their diplomas as a result of being honor students in the Chicana and Chicano uh, Studies uh, Department. So again, thank you to all of you for all of your hard work. Again, another shout out to Sebastian Ferrada for his, for his, for his fearless dedication and his visionary leadership. Um, again, I'd like to thank the, the families and we're going to take a, a, a photo, but then please stick around. We have a we have a lot we have lots of food again uh, with this beautiful backdrop of the lagoon so again thank you to everyone who made today possible it's a bit of a marathon and we couldn't do it um without so many people Sherrick, thank you so much for for all of your support joanne and out of the, all of the faculty professor casillas thank you so much Yeah, yeah. So that we all get like yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you.
This is a key to get up